going to replay a program that we first taped in 1979 during the Carter regime. It concerns the discovery of Russian troops in Cuba, and we did an analysis of what was behind this event with John Stockwell, the former CIA agent. A recent report in the NACLA, Report on the Americas, a magazine that regularly covers Caribbean and Latin American affairs, pointed out that this was a pivotal event in U.S. foreign policy. Previously, during the first years of the Carter regime, there was an attempt to reverse the trends of U.S. foreign policy. Carter was following a policy of supporting human rights. He wasn't automatically supporting all of the dictators that were supposedly protecting U.S. interests against communists. So, for instance, when the Somoza regime was overthrown in Nicaragua, Carter didn't send in troops nor did he send troops into Iran after the Shah was overthrown. But there were very powerful interests in the United States that didn't agree with Carter's foreign policy. So they attempted to embarrass him by pointing out that Russian troops were discovered in Cuba in 1979, as if the Russians were trying to establish a military base in the Caribbean that would threaten U.S. interests in that region and in Latin America. And in retrospect, this NACLA article indicated that it was really a turning point in U.S. foreign policy. It presented the end of detente, where henceforth Carter would be much tougher on the Soviets, relationships would worsen between the United States and the Soviet Union, and henceforth also, according to the NACLA article, there would be a globalization of politics in the Caribbean and in Latin America that would henceforth be played out as struggles between the superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. Well, we're very proud of this program that we did with John Stockwell, because at the very time that these events were going on, we were aware that this was a turning point in U.S. foreign policy, and we gave an explanation of what was really going on in Cuba, of why suddenly these Russian troops were discovered. And what we did was we taped the television network news coverage of the discovery of the Russian troops. And then with John Stockwell, we discussed what was really going on. It also gave us an a opportunity to critique, to do a criticism of the way that the network television news presents superficial and misleading reports on foreign politics and particularly on U.S.-Soviet relationships. So let us go back now to 1979 and the program that we taped with John Stockwell with a looking back at this very important incident that in recent times has been seen as a real turning point in U.S. affairs. Cuba is obstructing the Senate's work on SALT, the budget, and military planning. As a result, the administration is negotiating with both the USSR and the U.S. Senate. According to congressional sources, both negotiations are serious. With Soviet Ambassador Dobrynin, and with Senate leaders, serious and intricate. Politics on Cuba are more murky in the Senate than in the Kremlin. The administration must strike one deal with the Soviet Union, but many deals here. With Sam Nunn demanding a 5% increase in U.S. military spending before he will vote for SALT II. But Cuba has frozen SALT II. The administration must negotiate with Frank Church, who says no salt until all the Soviet combat troops leave Cuba. Carter can make no deal with the Soviet Union about the troops without dealing with powerful Scoop Jackson, who wants troops and jets and submarines out before he'll consider salt. And he won't even do that without a 5% military budget increase.
That brings Carter into entirely new negotiations with budget chairman Muskie, who opposes any major spending increase. And according to the White House press secretary, decisions were made about how to deal with the problem posed by those Soviet combat forces in Cuba. There was no further public comment on the nature of those decisions. However, here is a report from our White House correspondent, Sam Donaldson. President Carter may decide to counter the Soviet combat presence in Cuba by stepping up an American military presence, both in the Caribbean and elsewhere in the world. Unless, of course, the Soviets take steps on their own to change the status quo as the president has demanded. No one here will confirm that such a decision is in the works, but the president's own words on this subject 10 days ago point to such an approach. We do have the right to insist that the Soviet Union respect our interests and our concerns if the Soviet Union expects us to respect their sensibilities and their concerns. Otherwise, relations between our two countries will inevitably be adversely affected. What the president was clearly saying was that if the Russians don't change the status quo by taking action themselves, the United States will change it through its own actions. Not by provoking a warlike confrontation, but perhaps by stepping up U.S. combat forces in the Caribbean, which would serve to neutralize any possible threat from Cuba, and perhaps by challenging Soviet interest elsewhere, through a mix of military and economic moves that, while not directly threatening Moscow, would adversely affect Russian concerns. The president said one advisor is not going to paper over those troops. The status quo will be changed. Sam Donaldson, ABC News, the White House. This is John Scalley. Top administration officials have now started to consider a wide range of military and economic pressures against the Soviets. Among the most sensitive is the possibility of helping arm China with modern weapons, a step that would be sure to alarm the Kremlin. Any such move would come later after other less dangerous decisions, such as sharply reducing American grain shipments now at a record level. It is estimated that American wheat and feedstock exports to the Soviets will surpass $2 billion this year. Administration leaders would be most reluctant to order such cutbacks because of the humanitarian aspect involved in such sales. But if necessary, such decisions would be made, say informants, along with a sharp reduction in shipments of American machinery and high technology items. Military countermeasures would seek to avoid any direct military threat to the Soviets. But steps that would be considered are reinforcing American ground and United States units overseas, plus helping anti-Soviet forces near the Russian border. I hear told today that unless those Soviet troops are removed from Cuba, there's virtually no chance for Senate approval of the new strategic arms treaty with Moscow. The grim warning came at a White House meeting with congressional leaders. The president's got a tough problem. I said before, the only thing he can't do with this Russian troop problem is nothing. He's got to do something. This is Jimmy Carter's challenge. I, I think we've used too much time. I think the matter should have been dealt with by now. Well, John, you, you were telling me about the situation. Uh, I don't know whether it was you were in Cuba or a friend was in Cuba when the word came down the, oh, to cover it. Yeah, a friend, of, a friend of mine, an acquaintance of mine that I met since I got out of the CI was passing through town and he had been there covering the Non-Aligned Nations Conference. He was a writer or a he, reporter? He is a writer, yes, mm -hmm. working on a magazine in, uh, in Washington, a controversial magazine, but he was there as a reporter mm -hmm. with the reporters covering the conference. They got, the, the, the various reporters got instructions from their offices in Washington and New York to find out about the Soviets in Cuba. And they sent back uh, messages, according to him, uh, all of them saying, you've got to be kidding. This has got to be some kind of a grand put on. And uh, they got terse messages back from their headquarters saying, it's, it's the big story of right now. Do it. Find out about the, the Soviets in Cuba. And they couldn't believe it. It was, it was an international joke, literally. Now, well, let's back up a big step and note what, what nobody brought out, and they certainly could have, and that's that the, the, the subject, the issue of Soviet troops in Cuba was a spinoff, uh, an evolution of a CIA operation to disrupt and manipulate the Non-Aligned Nations Conference. Uh, Fidel Castro was managing this conference, was hosting it, uh, on, on in Cuba near America, which which is uh, a difference, and he's the old anathema to the CIA. The CIA tried to kill him so many times, uh, unsuccessfully, 20 years, unable to rid itself, uh, rid the United States of this communist leader on our shores. 
And this year, the, the Non-Aligned Nations Conference is meeting in Havana, hosted by Castro. The CIA went all out. The thing they seized on as an issue to discredit Castro was to make him appear to be not non-aligned. He's aligned with the Soviet Union, which is probably true. It's, it's probably his Achilles heel as a non-aligned uh, nation's leader is that he is aligned with the Soviet Union. Uh, how better could the CIA bring this out than to make a big issue of Soviet troops in Cuba? And uh, it's been leaked out. If you read these various articles in Time Magazine and the New York Times and the Washington Post and elsewhere, you notice that uh, it is admitted that the CIA was working with the National Security Council, the National Security Advisor, Brzezinski, on the, the subject of the conference, the upcoming conference. And they did seize on the presence of Soviet troops in Cuba as an issue. And in exactly during the conference, they make this, this dramatic announcement of Soviet troops in, uh, in Cuba. Now, what is brought out in bits and pieces, but not very well, by the media in covering this, by the statements that were quoted, is that th there was no threatening Soviet presence in Cuba. No one at any point pretended that the U.S. was a national security was being jeopardized by a Soviet force that could invade Florida or Puerto Rico or anywhere else. It was a trivial uh, 2,000 men, approximately. Uh, the, a lot of semantics were played on whether or not they were combat troops. Uh, well, I would react by saying that they were, in fact, combat troops, but combat troops are also instructors. So the Soviets may be telling the truth there. But uh, they, they, they're infantry troops, but they are not assault troops. Even President Carter, in one of his speeches, admitted this. They didn't have... They, they do not have the delivery capability, the, the ships, airplanes, helicopters, however, to, to move from Cuba to Florida or Puerto Rico or somewhere else. They're not assault troops. They don't have an aggressive posture or capability. They don't have the weapons that would go with a, an assault unit. Uh, the press dramatized this issue by talking, and you, you notice these commentators, the, the drama that they would get in their voices where they would say, Soviet troops in Cuba, you know, and it makes you want to sit up and, and get nervous. If they had said this tiny Soviet force in Cuba every time they brought it up or something like that, it would have put it into its true perspective. Something else... Well, John, do you think they manufactured the story then that we've known that there have been Soviet troops in Cuba since 1962? Definitely. There were something like 40,000 troops at that time, and most were withdrawn. But there's been two or three thousand troops there continually the whole time. And and Vance is the Secretary of State's first the fr the administration's first announcement of this as being an issue objected to the status quo. He did not object to the introduction of Soviet troops into Cuba. He said the status quo is unacceptable, because he knew that the Soviets knew and the Cubans knew that we knew that they had been there the whole time. There but was nothing new about this issue. The only thing that was new was the Non-Aligned Nations Conference happening. Right, but did the media adequately point out that no new cute Russian troops were actually recently placed in Cuba? Didn't they give the impression from the news clippings that this was something new, something threatening, oh. something dangerous, as if Russia had recently put a whole flock of new troops there that suddenly Certainly. posed a threat? Certainly so this is, this is really distortion of the grossest... Um, Magnitude, magnitude, because it's, it's exercising the American people, it's jeopardizing salt. Notice also that every one of the, the senators and, and other individuals that are quoted there has some major vested interest in making an issue out of this, except uh, perhaps Senator Byrd. Salt won't go, said Church, unless the troops are out. And presidential hopeful Baker said he won't be able to remain silent if the troops aren't out soon. Now, he either has the guts to do something about it, or he doesn't. Uh, there's no need to uh, look at this as though it's a crisis. I was here in the 1962 crisis. I've been here in some pretty tense moments. But there's no crisis here. Uh, Scoop Jackson is the original hawk, always clamoring for more arms and a, a, a more dramatic U.S. military posture. Uh, Baker, of course, and Goldwater, traditionally uh, critics of the Democratic administration, Baker with his own presidential aspirations, both of them conservative, both of them looking for issues that they can stir it up to, 
to egg the administration on to challenge the Soviets. To, uh, the Hawks uh, were able to play this issue into uh, a situation which, which apparently is going to lead, has led, and is going to lead to an escalation of military activity in the Caribbean and greater defense spending. We now have in, in the press uh, today 2,000 more U.S. Marines being put into Guantanamo Bay on Cuban soil and other Marine military uh, maneuvers in the Caribbean. It's been a, it's, it was a field day for the, for the Hawks. Uh, Dunn is another Hawk, 5% military uh, budget increase. Frank Church, of course, is a traditional liberal, but he's in jeopardy of losing his position in the new elections. His uh, state, I believe it's Idaho, has turned uh, conservative under him. And so he was back when this was launched. He, he, he was advised of it over a scrambled telephone while he was back in Idaho campaigning. And uh, he, his reaction is, has been quoted abundantly that he said, I can't sit on this. I can't keep this secret. Soviets in Cuba, I've got to come out with it. And the answer from the administration was, we realize that. Meaning, obviously, they called him while he was home, while he was on this ultra-conservative kick, to give him ammunition so he would bring it out and make an issue of it. Carter's uh, objectives are fairly clear. He, at the point that crisis, non-crisis broke, he had never been lower in the polls. His, his political future was, and still is, very much in doubt. And he needed some issue that he could, uh, some crisis or preferably awful sounding non-crisis so that he could thump his chest and show how macho he is in handling this non-crisis. And this, so he did. But didn't this backfire in some ways against Carter because, because he wasn't able to effectively do anything about it, that is he couldn't get the Russians to uh, remove the troops, that it made him look weak again? Oh, the, the networks made... Uh, this is what surprised me by looking at the uh, coverage of it. The networks constantly made Carter look like a fool. The president sought counsel from the congressional delegation. To the distinguished Jacob Javits, Mr. Carter said, what would you do? Reply, you mean you called us here at 8.30 in the morning to ask us what we would do? What are you going to do? Senators and congressmen were told the U.S. asked the Soviet Union if the troops were combat troops. Answer from Moscow, no. The U.S. asked if they would take the troops out anyway. Answer, no. Another answer to the same question is expected within a few days. Inquiry, how many days? President, two or three days. Vance, not that fast. Javits, can we have another meeting? Yes, within a week. Vance, not that fast. That is what you call your basic linkage between Cuba and SALT. Even though, sources said, the meeting was told the United States still does not know why the Soviet troops are there. And we do not know exactly how serious it all is. Another president accused the president of trying to have it both ways, of being hard on one hand and soft on the other. According to this source, the meeting was not very enlightening or satisfying. Senate Democratic Majority Leader Robert Byrd didn't even bother to attend the meeting with the president. Byrd claimed that he had received a briefing from Secretary Vance last night. The result of today's meeting, the president did win some more time. However, he did not generate much confidence in his leadership. The president hopes this policy will convince hardliners, particularly those in the Senate who are holding the SALT Treaty hostage, that he has effectively neutralized the Russian troops, while at the same time proving anew that he does not panic in a crisis and risk general war. But already the president's plan has hit one tiny snag. Mr. Carter wanted to go on television Sunday night. And word of that leaked so widely in Washington that one afternoon newspaper here headlined the Carter talk on Cuba on Sunday. Then the White House discovered that Sunday was the high holy Jewish holiday Yom Kippur. And so in some confusion, it rescheduled the speech for Monday night. Sam Donaldson, ABC News, the White House. He gave a lot of uh, TV network coverage to Connolly and Baker and these right-wing Republicans attacking Carter for being soft. So I think Carter really lost politically on this one. Also, after the, um, he, the speech that Carter made, where he outlined his plan, immediately the headlines on the 10 o'clock news were Russian troops to stay in Cuba, as if Carter had not really done anything and had therefore failed to be a strong 
uh, leader. Well, isn't there a certain justice in that, though? Because this uh, this whole thing started with an operation Brzezinski and the CIA juned up to embarrass Cuba and the Soviets, and uh, but. President, they work for President Carter. The, the the CIA is part of the White House, and 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 Carter uh, permitted it. Apparently, encouraged it to be brought brought out and made public and made into an international issue. And uh, in that sense, it's backfiring on him. as a certain amount of justice. He had Secretary Vance make the the statements and say, make an issue out of it, throw the gauntlet down, say the status quo is unacceptable. And the amateurishness of this administration was, was shown right then and there in that the status quo was unchangeable by the United States, except this, this very weak solution he came up with in the end, that, well, we can't do anything about the Soviets in Cuba, so uh, we'll increase our own military activity around. You always wonder uh, how much something like this was planned ahead of time since it had so much of an effect of encouraging the hawks and leader, leading to greater military activity and spending, how much of it was, was uh, determined ahead of time? Let's, let's make an issue of the Soviet troops there so we can get into this defense spending. Particularly since they'd known about it for 17 years. Since they'd known about it for 17 years. Well, I noticed uh, frequently that they would toss around the CIA as well we have good intelligence. I got a briefing by Stanfield Turner, blah, blah. They would be bringing it in as if that would automatically give the stamp of expertise on it. I was just in a briefing with Stanfield Turner, the head of the CIA, a few moments ago, and he believes that those troops are not there just to, to train Cubans. However, we do not know the mission of those troops. Early this morning, National Security Council members, including CIA Director Turner and Secretary of State Vance, arrived to continue talks with the President, which went on here until late last night. About Senator Baker's suggestion that the President now release intelligence photographs of the Soviet troops in Cuba, ABC News diplomatic correspondent Barry Dunsmore reports the State Department will oppose doing that while negotiations are still underway. But if the talks break down, release of the evidence might be a good idea. It's amazing how they would dare to do that when you have this history of incredible, endless intelligence failures by the CIA. And crisis after crisis after crisis, the CIA coming up with faulty or false information. And uh, for them to cite Stansfield Turner in a situation like this, remember the last U.S.-Cuban confrontation where, where uh, President Carter was calling uh, President Castro a liar? and vice versa was uh, a year and a half ago at the time the Katangis invaded the Shaba. And uh, President Carter said that we had intelligence that uh, it was a Cuban operation. And uh, Castro said it absolutely was not a Cuban operation, that it was Katangis and Cuba had nothing to do with it. And President Carter did much as they had there. He had CI, you know, the CIA had information proving it. Eventually, it was resolved by some senators going down to Havana and meeting with Castro at his invitation, and he convinced them that there was reasonable doubt. And they went back and demanded and were shown the CIA's intelligence. And the 17 senators walked out of that meeting and said it didn't prove the, the presence of Cuba behind that invasion at all. In other words, in yet another situation, uh, President Carter uh, was not telling the truth. He was misinformed, and he was distorting the information, lying, if you will. And uh, Fidel Castro was telling the truth. What amazes me, once again, is the absolute distortion of Gromyko speech and the Russians' uh, position. Uh, the Russians admitted they had troops there and that they'd been there for a long time. Gromyko said, you know, this is a foolish put-up job, and let's forget about it and get on with the business of salt. And yet then the senators would come and say, Gromyko's lying. Yes. He's an absolute liar. He called it like it was. Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko today dismissed the American charge with a short, blunt demand, forget it. In his speech to the United Nations General Assembly, Mr. Gromyko said it was all part of a campaign to spread lies about the policies of Cuba and the Soviet Union. But the truth is that this propaganda is totally without foundation in reality.
And our advice on this score is simple. It is high time that you honestly admit that this whole matter is artificial and proclaim it to be closed. Although Mr. Gromyko did not even mention the presence of Soviet troops in Cuba, it was clear this is what he was talking about. Just two weeks ago, the Soviet Union admitted it does have troops in Cuba, but only to train the Cubans in Soviet military hardware, that their duties and numbers have not changed in 17 years, and that any charges that organized Soviet combat units have arrived in Cuba are totally groundless. And Mr. Gromyko insisted that there's no reason for concern. The Soviet Union and other countries of the socialist community have never threatened anybody, nor are they threatening anybody now. This is Lucioffi, ABC News at the United Nations. This is Ann Compton at the Capitol, where senators who have seen American intelligence photos say Gromyko is lying. I'm astonished. There is simply no basis for doubting that the Soviet Union, that the Russians have a fully equipped, fully manned combat brigade in Cuba. I would hope that the president now would consider releasing the very, very reliable intelligence data we have, including aerial and satellite photography, to conclusively show that there are Russian combat troops in Cuba. Each senator pointed out that Gromyko was involved in another Cuban dispute, the 1962 missile crisis. I think the, that the president uh, really has to be firm in this and just remind the American people that this is the same Mr. Gromyko who lied about missiles. And he was caught red-handed, and, and I regret that Mr. Gromyko has seen fit to, to state a bald-faced lie. That's what it is. Gromyko's intervention has had a chilling effect on the strategic arms treaty with the Soviets. A growing number of senators, including the man in control of the treaty, Foreign Relations Chairman Frank Church, say that unless the president can soon certify that the Russian combat forces have been dismantled, the SALT Treaty will be put on ice. It was not a good day today for the United States at the United Nations. He goes lying. Yes. He's an absolute he, liar. He called it like it was. He said that they were there. He, he said they were not assault troops. But they were there for training, and uh, certainly we have troops all over the world that are there to help install our, our, and train and use our, our military equipment, the hardware we've installed. We had for many years this huge unit in, in Addis Ababa. We have, have of course, 5,000 troops on the Soviet border in Turkey. Uh, these troops uh, have no capability of invading Russia, for heaven's sake, but they are combat troops. They've all been trained in how to shoot rifles and whatnot. And I would say that uh, the only two people I saw in there who, who seemed to be candidly, uh, call three, I guess, calling it like it was, was uh, Senator Byrd, who said it was a non-crisis. Gromyko, who, who it appeared to me, called it like it was, said you're making something out of nothing for your own purposes. And then Fidel Castro also calling it like it was. And, and Andrew Young, also. And Andrew Young, yes. Y que nosotros llamamos centro de instrucción. And which we call training center. Está en Cuba. Desde hace 17 años. Has been in Cuba for the past 17 years. Esa instalación militar. Now then, that military facility fue creada al final de la crisis de octubre de 1960. Was established at the end of the October crisis in 1962. 1962. Conforme al espíritu de los acuerdos. In conformity with the spirit of the agreements. De octubre de ese año. Signed on October of that year. Y dentro del statu quo establecido como consecuencia de la crisis. And within the status quo that was set up as a result of the October crisis. Yeah. Why has he brought this problem to the light now to create a situation? Porque el hecho de que esté en crisis la reducción de Carter. Because the fact that Carter's uh, situation is in a crisis. No le da derecho a poner en crisis. Does not give him the right paz. to place peace into a crisis. Y yo pienso que la actuación de Carter And en relación a este problema. And I believe that Carter's behavior concerning the problem ha sido deshonesta, has been dishonest, ha sido insincera, has been unsincere, ha sido inmoral, has been immoral, y está engañando la opinión and pública has been mundial, deceiving the world public opinion, y a la opinión pública de Estados Unidos. and the U.S. public opinion. Andrew Young bowed out as a diplomat, speaking his mind, as usual. Last night he spoke to 5,000 blacks 
And at a time when the administration has been saying it's gravely concerned over those Soviet combat troops in Cuba, Young ridiculed the threat. If the Russians made a move against us, our defenses are strong enough to ignore and wipe out and obliterate some 3,000 Cubans and, I mean, Russians in Cuba. What the hell can they do to the United States of America? is a totally irrelevant political issue that has nothing to do with the national security of this nation. More relevant, Young said, is inflation and unemployment, more of a threat than troops in Cuba. Then Young philosophized about what he thinks is wrong with foreign policy. It's not some amorphous strategic concept decided by some folk that ain't never fought no wars, don't know nothing about suffering, never been poor, and essentially and isolate themselves in some ivory tower writing papers and theorizing to each other. Those are the folk. Those essentially are the folk that have created the mess that the world is now in. Andrew Young's beautiful comment. And the other people, wow. John, don't you think that uh, the network news is irresponsible in failing to give this broader context for the story in leaving out the fact that this was a uh, story based on leaks that really gave no new information and in the way they played this up night after night and gave all these hawks uh, such a uh, pervasive coverage. You know, our, our enemies overseas, we talk about communist censorship of the press. And uh, the communists talk about our censorship of the press, or our press working for the government. And as we sit here, we find this an incredible charge fr from the communists, because we know that we have freedom of the press. Uh, you can go out and start a newspaper with a mimeograph machine and print more or less what you want, and you probably won't be eliminated the next day by the FBI, although that has been known to happen. But uh, it, the fact is that while you can't claim plausibly, and I wouldn't, that the New York Times or the Washington Post uh, or Time Magazine or Newsweek, the biggies, uh, are actually controlled by the administration, not in the sense of the administration calling them up and saying, here's our line on this issue, everybody do it. The press plays directly into the hands of the ad administration. It's the voice of a given administration. The press has gotten us into uh, incredible situations in the world, devastating situations in the world, such as uh, the Vietnam War. If the, if the Vietnam War, if the press had been conscientious in nailing the administration on its lies and distortions during the Vietnam War, during the buildup of the Vietnam War, it never would have happened. If they had balked then, if they had had interviews with people and then had someone come on, afterwards saying, unfortunately, that all of that's untrue. See, the press tries, it claims it presents the facts. And facts are, are uh, if President Carter or Scoop Jackson or Goldwater, someone makes a speech, that is a fact that he made that speech and said those words. Now, the fact that all of those words were false uh, is never clarified to the public. So the administration can use the press to, to put out whatever it wants to on a given situation, and the press will play along for the sense of drama, as they say, to sell newspapers. So you have crises like this that could never have existed if the press had nailed them at the outset and said, this is nonsense. It's a non-crisis. There's another irony here in that during this very uh, period, the Russians uh, went to East Germany in, in a very big uh, flourish. They said they were going to take 20,000 Russian troops out of East Germany and we were going to withdraw a lot of their forces from uh, Central Europe. And this was hardly covered. There were only seconds of coverage, whereas this seemed to be a major change in uh, Soviet uh, policy and a potential thaw in Europe, which could be much more important than this non-event in Cuba. And yet, this was barely mentioned. This is how the press can create some stories and how they don't even uh, cover. You've got, to, you've got to remember, and this is why I titled my book In Search of Enemies, it's necessary to our system of government to have people to oppose and people to hate. If you'll look, for example, uh, I believe it was yesterday, President Carter just finished a small political swing, 
uh, he made uh, repeated statements about Cuba, Cuba's aggressive posture, Cuba's military, the, the, the Cuba being the, the most militarized country in the world, etc. Surely we have things that are more important uh, than Cuba to, to this nation right now, the collapsing economy, the galloping inflation, all of the various uh, minority groups that are still suffering persecution in this country. He, he, nevertheless, he focuses on Cuba and makes them into an enemy which they have no desire to be so that we've got somebody to hate, to oppose, so that we've got an excuse to thump our chest and build up our military machine. And he's doing this, obviously, as a, a major element in his presidential campaign, searching for enemies, looking for people that don't want to fight us, uh, that we, we need to have somebody to oppose. I think there's also kind of a long-range thing that they're looking forward to here also. Uh, you read some books and see some statements by the high muckety-mucks, and they complain that the Vietnam War has had such a uh, devastating effect on public opinion that they can't wheel and deal around the world now like they used to because public opinion would not uh, allow it. People would uh, hit the streets again. So I think this is part of an overall policy of trying to whip up the Cold War rhetoric and look for enemies, like you say, so that people will become hawkish and accept a more uh, militant stance and activist stance around the world. As a matter of fact, it re resulted in the poll which was mentioned by AP and NBC. The Associated Press poll shows Americans by three to one want the SALT Treaty held up by the Senate until the Russian troops are moved out of Cuba. 66% said hold up the treaty, 22% said don't, the others didn't know. John, how would you comment on Carter's speech on this incident where he claimed that Cuba was a puppet, a satellite of the Soviet Union, that was an economic uh, failure? Do you think that's an accurate uh, account? Well, you notice uh, Fidel Castro was on uh, 60 Minutes uh, the night before President Carter's big speech on this subject. And uh, he called President Carter dishonest on this, this subject. And then the next night, uh, Carter went on television, and it was almost as though he set out to prove Castro right. His presentation of the facts was so distorted, and he left out these, these glaring omissions that would give some balance to the thing, that would have explained it and put it into its perspective. Things like uh, Cuba's long-standing and repeated offer, overture to us to normal normalize relations, uh, which we have consistently spurned. Uh, the presence, he did not mention the presence of, uh, of our Marine Corps base on Cuban soil. Now, mind you, if the Soviets had troops on U.S. soil or Cuban troops on U.S. soil, it would be a different thing, but we actually maintain a Marine Corps base on Cuban soil. He made a big thing out of the, the, the Cuba's dependency, economic dependency on the Soviet Union, and he called it uh, Cuba the economic failure of communism. He didn't point out that we've had a 20-year economic war against Cuba, that it's a long ways from Russia and it's very close to us. This war has included, of course, the, the assassination attempts on the leader and the propaganda efforts to, to, to disrupt the morale of the country. But aside from all that, projects to destroy their sugar crops. Uh, and, and, and Cuba is almost totally dependent on its sugar, for one thing. Uh, a, a blockade of Cuba for many, many years. Embargo on the sale of many things to Cuba. We did everything we could to make them into our enemy and to force them into the arms of the Soviet Union, to force them to be dependent on the Soviet Union. We could have taken the opposite policy and tried to help them get established economically so that they could be part of the community of nations and not be aligned with the Soviet Union. We pushed them into the arms of the Soviet Union. He didn't bother to point that out. This, it's the greatest irony, I think the hardest thing for Americans to, to understand and realize and face and accept is that our presidents have now a tradition of being the most duplicious of any world leaders. Our presidents lie the most as a matter of policy because of the secrecy establishment. Now, it was, it was absolute proof of the pudding of the whole thing about the CIA. This was another CIA operation
that got out of hand, a rogue elephant, they like to call him, that put, uh, that it jeopardized salt too, and put the United States in the position of being ridiculed in the eyes of the world, and preoccupied our government for three weeks until Carter finally. Did you notice how, when he was on television, how he kept smirking? <laughs> he would be talking very seriously about all these heavy things, and then he would kind of give his, his, little, his little grin. He couldn't repress it because he knew what a joke this whole thing was. There, were, there was no crisis. But at the same time, it had become a crisis in the sense that salt, too, was at stake. Well, Al Slavinsky is going to join us now, and we'll proceed with uh, more in-depth discussion of this and other, um, other items which might be on your mind. It's clear to me this is a pseudo-issue, but I'm not clear of how the CIA is behind this. Okay. You have to read between the lines only a little bit to understand the CIA's role because it has been stated uh, in the last few weeks. Uh, I would be more alert to what these statements meant, having been part of these things before. But every three years, there's the, the Non-Aligned Nations Conference. And every three years, nine months before the conference, the CIA mounts a massive operation to discredit, disrupt, and manipulate this conference. In, uh, in 19, uh, whenever it was, 1970, uh, the big issue was China was trying to get into the United Nations. And uh, we were uh, uh, leaning in the direction of talking directly to China. But the, the thrust of the Non-Aligned Nations Conference operation was to get all of the de delegates possible to, to oppose endorsing the entry of China into the United Nations. I was involved in that one. I had an agent who was uh, an intellectual third world figure uh, who was a, 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 an official in his government who could go to this conference. And so I was leaned on by headquarters. Every station, CIA station in the world, gets these cables saying, not just do you have anyone who would go, but they go through your files back at headquarters and find out what agents you have and come in and say, send in our intellect to this place and tell him what to say. And I got out my agent and, and leaned on him and said, uh, uh, this is the line you've got to take vis-a-vis -vis China. And he said, wait a minute. He said, wait a minute. He said, my, my country is very poor. We need China. We need a relation with China. You're ordering me to sabotage my country's interests for one of your political ploys when everybody can see that the United States is in the process of going to bed with China in her own economic interests. He said, how can I do that? And ours, too. Yeah. And so I, I, I went back to headquarters and said that he was not responsive. And so they sort of put an X on how well he stood as a disciplined agent and wrote you know, little things about, you know, I didn't have complete control of all my agents. Well, we shouldn't really dismiss the Cuban thing as being a Mickey Mouse situation. Well, because here's what happened. There's going to be an increase in defense spending because oh, of it. There's going to be increased military grandest, presidents. It's, it's, it has turned out it's a tempest in a teapot, but it won it jeopardized salt. I think that'll blow over and people will get exactly. over that. But it has, le it has wound up when, when we're, we were moving in the direction of support for salt and a reduction of strategic weapons and military posturing. That's, that's what these treaties should be about. It has wound up to be a victory for the Hawks in the, in the Defense Department and, and in the CIA as well. And also, well. This, this is kind of reminiscent of the days when Hoover would create a threat uh, and go out and stomp it down and get more money from Congress in the process. Isn't the CIA doing the same thing? Exactly, um, although I don't, knowing them as, as I feel I, I do, as I, I did and I believe I still do, I don't think that they are, uh, they have enough mind about there's enough of, a, of a, an intellect driving what they do. They always have these Non-Aligned Nations Conference. This time it's a biggie because it's in Cuba and it's the old CIA nemesis. Castro is running it. This is the man the CIA tried eight times to kill. He's tried to destroy uh, uh, Cuba's sugar crops and whatnot. He, uh, we've forced, the CIA has forced him to be totally dependent on the Soviet Union economically. And he has, he has stuck his finger in the CIA's eye over the years time and time again and gotten away with it. And he's doing it again 90 miles from our own shores. So the CIA was obviously incensed. And, and by that, I, when you say CIA in that context, you mean the intelligence establishment. Because there are people who don't work in the language, like Zbigniew Brzezinski, for example, that don't work in the CIA, but they're part of the same complex. And uh, it's now, it's, it's been admitted by the White House that uh, Brzezinski 
met with the CIA, 40 committee meetings, uh, are, are the operations advisory group meetings with the CIA director, and ordered the CIA to focus on Cuba and focus on their vulnerabilities and focus on Soviets in Cuba. And this was, this, they admitted that this began last March. And so they focused on the, their operation to discredit Castro. I believe that the CIA is, is a, a, a moral uh, tragedy and that it's discredited the United States and that it should be closed down, that we should revert to openness and telling, telling it like it is and telling the truth to people. I think secrecy doesn't work. I think it masks and provides a cover for people to do things which would definitely be unacceptable to the society at large. There's nothing they do that is forthright, positive, that you can stand up in church or wherever you go and say, I'm, you know, this is what I did last week and I'm proud of it. Overseas, it's all. You're a secret operative. That means your existence there is a lie. You're pretending to be a diplomat or a scholar or something, which you're not. Uh, you're getting information covertly, and that means, I mean, we have diplomats in these countries who talk to people endlessly. If the information is overtly available, uh, they will get it. You're there to bribe and to induce people to be spies, to commit treason. And you're also there to instigate activities, uh, meaning subversion. Now, these are heavy crimes in every country in the world, normally punishable by death. This is what the CIA does. The mass media then uh, open and willing to discuss your more radical ideas about uh, abolishing the CIA? Are they willing to debate this? Last time I talked to you on the phone, you were talking about a letter that you'd written to the New York Times or a column for the op-ed page about the abolition of the CIA. Did they ever publish that? No. Uh, the initial reaction of the press and the mass media to me was, was quite good. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say there was 98 or 99 percent favorable. The one exception was the Washington Post, which is a conspicuously Washington establishment newspaper and very close to the CIA. Uh, but since the, the initial impact of publicity of who is John Stockwell and what does he have to say, uh, simultaneously as the months have tracked, there's been a change in the stance of our, of our government, our establishment, including our press establishment, uh, responding to President Carter's line and Vice President Mondale's line and Admiral Turner's lobbying to get off the CIA's back and permit it to get back to work. And this is very conspicuous if you read the editorial uh, sections of the Washington Post and the New York Times and Time Magazine and Newsweek. It's, I mean, it's not a covert, subtle thing. They're coming out and saying it. Let's get off. Uh, get off the CIA's back and let them get back to work. Well, of course, work, you know, for the CIA is... is <laughs> heinous crimes against humanity. That's their function. Doesn't this show something very disturbing, and that is how the mass media and the political establishment go along with these CIA uh, games that they're dupes, or are they willing accomplices? How do you read the role of the media? You know, I was complaining about issue? exactly this just a couple of days ago to a friend of mine on the New York Times and another friend on the Washington Post on the long-distance uh, telephone pointing out that our press has accepted a stance which makes it sort of the, the, the willing uh, uh, participant in such government misdeeds and ploys and, and, and blunders. Uh, what the press does, essentially, is they report, they try to report facts. There are obvious biases and whatnot, but essentially they report facts. If President Carter makes a speech the word, it's a fact that he made a speech. And it's a fact that he said this, that, or the other. The fact that everything he said is a lie, the press doesn't take it as their responsibility to point that out. So what they do is when a crisis like this develops, they quote, they have, you know, there's the, the fact that the president said such and so, and somebody else, and somebody else, and Senator Church, and, and, and uh, uh, Senator Jackson, and who was a senator from Florida, and their lies and misstates statements and exaggerations are, are become the issue, even though they're false, and even though everyone involved in the press knows that they're false, no one in the press points this out to the readers. This seems even the, ed the editors who write their columns rarely tackle the president or the secretary of state or even an Admiral Turner. They will take him on sometime, but they how often do you read
uh, an, an article. Did you, after the, the President's speech the other night uh, about this crisis, were th was there any editorial in a major newspaper that said that he, he lied on point after point after point? Well, you know, one thing John pointed out before when he was on the show that the CIA uh, has now, I guess, and, and admitted that they have bought journalists in the past, mm -hmm. but you also pointed out that a lot of events were staged for the benefit of the press, and stories are, of course, spoon-fed to the press um, by the CIA, and most of these go unchallenged. Well, there's a social relationship and class relationship with the upper people who control the newspapers and run the newspapers, boy the network. old boy network. This has been pointed out by, you know, um, many months back when they were talking about CIA and press relationships. Well, the press people, uh, the top members of the press, meet in the Bilderberg Group along with members of the CIA. They're in the same... Uh, social clubs, they know each other on a personal basis, so naturally there's going to be a relationship. And what, what evolves is, uh, the end result of all this, is that the CIA's existence in the 50s and the 60s, when it galloped so, f it, it got so far out of line, drug sex experiments on unwitting American guinea pigs, uh, uh, assassination attempts of world leaders. Some successful. Some successful, and, and many, many uh, crimes that you can only describe as depraved. Uh, and Vietnam War, and the Angola and War, and coups, and these things were, were permissible. This, this evolution of this organization was possible only with the indulgence of the press. If the press had been alert, had been smoking this organization out, had been reporting that the CIA is doing this, that, and the other, it could never have gotten by with it. This is my big disappointment now, is to see the nation, the establishment turning, and the press establishment. This is what I said over the phone just yesterday, I think, the last conversation was in this series of conversations, was just that, that we're heading right back where we were with the indulgence of the press. The press is cooperating with the government to put the CIA back in action just where it was. Mind you, we've gone through all of these exposures of 1975 and 76, and, and the CIA's charter has actually been expanded in the last three years since then. Well, John, you were talking about the press and the fact that they have not performed this watchdog function. Even when they have the opportunity, such as your letter to the New York Times, tell us about that. Well, there have been, there've been a couple. I don't, I don't have the time to spend a lot of time writing all the letters that occur to me, obviously. I think we all have that syndrome of reading something and say, boy, I'd like to answer that myself. And occasionally I, I read something and I really do feel like I have something valid to say. But uh, last year I got a call from an editor of the New York Times who said that uh, they had run an article from Congressman Stratton, a letter calling for a stronger expanded CIA and deploring the fact that the nation was weak because the CIA was in trouble, it was broken down. They had run a letter from Admiral Turner saying, don't worry about it, we, we need help, we need your support, but, but we're still out there pitching, so don't, don't worry about it too much, uh, but give us your help. And this guy, who's, I believe, mind and heart are, are pretty honest and pretty much in the right place, called me and he said, we've got to have somebody come in and say, wait a minute, you know, the other side of that is is calling for a closure of the CIA, and so why don't you write that one, Stockwell? And I spent three weeks. I didn't do anything else. I wrote this thing, and I rewrote it. I talked to him on the phone. I rewrote it. I rewrote it. I rewrote it. I rewrote it, and they never ran it. Did they ever tell you why? I talked to him endlessly, but essentially it boiled down. Uh, at the end, he, he, he quit returning my phone calls because he was getting embarrassed because essentially... The, the, the one editor comes up with an article he likes and he shops it around the other editors and if they all sort of agree it gets momentum going until the boss says okay let's run with it and he couldn't get the momentum the, 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 they just weren't going to run an article that was anti-CIA and they did not and my own experience by the way uh, in dealing with the New York Times that time and three other occasions uh, and dealing with the Washington Post where I've also published is that the, the New York Times is, uh, is at least ten times as enlightened as the Washington Post. Well, this most recent letter which you wrote to the New York Times also reveals the same type of thinking. You wrote to them about the Cuban uh, situation, did you not? Yes, I, I wrote to them about the Cuban situation, and uh, I must admit this time I was wiser and more experienced, and also the editor that I was talking to was quite candid with me and quite straightforward.
and uh, he told me the reasons quite promptly why they couldn't run it. It was very frustrating to me because I thought it should be run. And he would say, he agreed, and then he would say, but it's not going to run. And so obviously it just, you know, in, in the, that, that small group of people, that article was not going to get priority over the others. But the, the same principle is that no one has pointed out on, in an international organ, a Western international organ, that this thing started with a CI operation which got out of hand. It was a little bit more successful than the CI ever dreamed. And politics. We're not playing with little secret operations that affect no one. Our, our economic problems now are greatly tied to this $165 billion disaster in Vietnam. That was a CI operation for at least seven years before we began an overt military campaign. The, the CIA was deeply involved in a secret war in Southeast Asia and trying to get the United States government involved. The first whistleblower was a gentleman named Paul Sakwa, who was not, because of the mood of the nation and the press and whatnot, was not given an audience. He did not succeed in speaking out. He didn't have quite the whatever it takes to write a book and get it published, but he resigned his job in the early 60s in protest over the CIA's efforts to, to lobby, to bullshit the American public about what was happening in Vietnam. And he quit because the station in Saigon was putting out false information, consciously discussing their ploys to lobby to get the Americans to wake up to the threat and do, quote, the right thing. The CIA, remi remember, has published, by then it had published, a couple of thousand English language books, that means for American consumption, that were secretly published by the CIA, paying someone to write a book. And, and many of those books at that time were about Vietnam. In Angola, we would not have had that war, I warrant, if there had been public debate. You had Henry Kissinger and Bill Colby of the CIA wanted this war. Uh, and they got it because they were able to do it in secrecy. They lied to the Senate in order to get it done. The American interests that were in Angola were significant. You had Gulf Oil and Boeing doing business with the Angolan government. They were not permitted to vote, to discuss, to participate in the decision to go to war in Angola. They were distressed when it happened, when they found out. They were, they were put out of business temporarily by this secret war. The American churches had extensive missionary organizations inside Angola, and they were not permitted to, to participate in the decision to go into Angola. And, and, of course, the American scholars who were working in Angola, traveling the exchanges, they were not permitted to participate. You had two individuals engineer this war who had never been to Angola, and one of them had never set foot in Africa in his life. Neither of them were Africanists, even, and they engineered a war and got it done because of secrecy. You know, I watch on things like this Tom Snyder show on NBC where the, the, the Turner is, is on and given uh, n uh, national prime time to say that people who attack the CIA, like Stockwell and others, Bill Shep and others, are un-American. They're traitors, was his word, and his eyes glinted while he said that. And uh, that's, that's Admiral you know, who Turner, is America? Admiral Turner, the director yeah. of the CIA. Now, who is American? Turner insists on secrecy, and he's lobbying for laws to put people like me in jail for going to the American people and telling what we've done in America's name with America's tax dollars. And I ask you, who is American? Who is the traitor to the American system? The John Stockwells and Frank Snaps and others who are exercising the American principle of participating, of working together to discuss what our country is doing and try to influence it. Lord knows I might be wrong in my position towards Angola or, or any position in the world, but it's the American process to stand up and thrash it out. And that's Alternative Views for this evening. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network. P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78713. If you have any comments, questions, please contact us at this address. Good night.